So our next section is the brainstem, and uh, more details on the brainstem will come um, in the stroke lecture. But just as a review where we're at here, um, now I'm going to skip over the cerebellum, and we'll do that next time because the cerebellum makes more sense if we've covered some brainstem um, anatomy first. All right, so uh, most of you are aware of the rule of fours, which does give um, kind of a big picture of the brainstem. It's not entirely accurate, but uh, if you can remember that cranial nerves 9 through 12, you want to associate with the medulla, cranial nerves 5 through 8 in the pons, cranial nerves 3 and 4, the midbrain, cranial nerves 1 and 2, um, really our central nervous system pathways. Um, like I said, not entirely accurate because we will see that the spinal trigeminal um, tract, a very important part of the trigeminal system, uh, extends all the way into the medulla. So there are some other exceptions. Cranial nerves that divide evenly into 12, we will find along the midline. So that's 3, 4, 6, and 12. And the others, we will find more laterally. Okay, there are four midline pathways. As the name indicates, the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay, we're going to talk about this in our lecture on multiple sclerosis. The motor tract of the cortical spinal tract, the medial lemniscus, and the motor nuclei of those cranial nerves I just mentioned that divide into 12, 3, 4, 6, and 12. And then four of our major sensory pathways are lateral, the spinothalamic tract, spinocerebellar tracts, the sympathetic chain, and the sensory cranial nerve nuclei. Okay, so um, I'll point out a few things um, on this drawing here. So if we look down at the medulla, here we have the nucleus ambiguous in blue. This is the motor nucleus for 9 and 10. So we can see glossopharyngeal and then branches of the vagus nerve here. Um, back here in blue is the dorsal motor uh, nucleus of the vagus. So this is the parasympathetic contribution to the vagus. And we'll also talk about the solitary nucleus, which is sensory for 7, 9, and 10. Here we have the hypoglossal nucleus and the spinal accessory down here. So again, 9 through 12, we'll associate with the medulla. Uh, we'll make a very important point about the pons, one of the most important brainstem syndromes. Um, you need to, can only understand that if you realize the close relationship between cranial nerve 7 here as it wraps around 6. Okay, and then up here we have some of the trigeminal nuclei. Here's the mesencephalic nucleus. We'll explain what that does. Okay, here are the different branches of the trigeminal nerve. And in blue we have the uh, trigeminal motor nucleus for chewing. Okay, and we can see that that branch goes out here with the uh, V3 distribution of the trigeminal nerve. And here is that important spinal trigeminal tract. Um, here and nucleus. So this is for pain and temperature of the face. And just notice this goes all the way down to the medulla. All right, here's the trochlear nucleus, really long course. That's why it gets easily damaged. And up in the midbrain, we have cranial nerves um, uh, three with uh, both the Edinger Westfall nucleus and the oculomotor nuclei. And we'll talk about that in some detail. All right, so let's start in the medulla. First, the nucleus ambiguous, and this is not a typo, it's UUS. This is the motor nucleus for 9 and 10, and this is a nucleus that degenerates early in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So as we mentioned, that will give uh, the patient a bulbar palsy with uh, very prominent dysarthria and dysphagia. The other important uh, clinical syndrome to associate with a lesion of the nucleus ambiguous is lateral medullary syndrome. And so this is a stroke that can be due either to occlusion of the pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, or more often the vertebral um, artery. And this syndrome is unique in that it is frequently related to trauma. And so if patients present with the lateral medullary syndrome after a car accident or something like that, then you know the etiology has to be dissection of the vertebral artery. And so um, the nucleus ambiguous will give these patients very prominent dysphagia. And really of all stroke syndromes, these patients are at one of the highest risk for aspiration. 
So uh, you need to be very aware of that. Patients shouldn't be eating or drinking. They frequently need an NG tube or even a PEG tube for a period of time until swallowing uh, improves. Uh, nucleus ambiguous lesion will also give patients uh, a significant dysarthria and often a dysphonia, kind of a hoarse voice. And then hiccups are a classic feature of lateral medullary syndrome, and all of that is from involvement of the nucleus ambiguous. And so um, I've not labeled this because this is really difficult. I don't think boards would ask you to identify this, um, but in the medulla here, the nucleus ambiguous is in this lateral location. You really can't even see the nucleus in here amongst um, everything else. All right, but you definitely need to be able to recognize it. I would say it's one of the top five um, step one questions for neurology. And so here is our stroke in the lateral medulla. And so very important, the rule of thumb for any brainstem stroke syndrome is you get ipsilateral cranial nerve deficits, contralateral motor or sensory deficits. And so um, in lateral medullary syndrome, the ipsilateral cranial nerve deficit that we can really easily see on exam involves the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract. So here the lesion is on the right, so the patient will have a loss of pain and temperature on the right side of the face. Okay, the pathway that is involved here is the spinal trigeminal tract. And so recall this is carrying pain and temperature that's already crossed, travels through the lateral medulla. So the patient if they have a right lateral medullary syndrome, will have loss of pain and temperature on the left side of the body. So that is your classic crossed finding for lateral medullary syndrome. All right, here's the nucleus ambiguous. We already talked about the deficit that uh, that will cause. The vestibular nuclei are in the lateral medulla, so that gives patients nausea, vomiting, vertigo. Um, here's the descending sympathetic pathway and that travels through the lateral medulla, so the patient will have an ipsilateral Horner syndrome. And then the pica also supplies the inferior cerebellar peduncle and the inferior surface of the cerebellum. So that will give a patient ipsilateral ataxia. And inferior cerebellar peduncle lesions often, for the patient, will create a feeling that they're pulled to that side. So if we have a right um, inferior cerebellar peduncle stroke, the patient, when they try to walk, will just always feel like they're being pulled to the right. So there's a lot to know for lateral medullary syndrome, but um, really high yield. Now, when we see patients with lateral medullary syndrome, uh, remember that CT does a lousy job of looking at the brain stem for ischemic lesions. So these are really small. You're going to need an MRI scan to diagnose. And if you think it's due to a vertebral artery dissection, you'd need to do an angiogram study. And that would be important because you're going to treat uh, a dissection different than you would uh, like a thrombosis of the pica. All right, now also in the lateral medulla is the solitary nucleus and tract. It can occasionally be involved in lateral medullary syndrome, but um, not very often. So unlike the nucleus ambiguous, which is motor, this is a sensory nucleus for 7, 9, and 10. And so importantly, uh, stretch receptors in the lung and in the arterial system feed into the solitary nucleus, um, as does taste. And just recall the anterior two-thirds of the tongue for taste is seven, posterior of the one-third is nine. And so if we have a lesion here, if we did have lateral medullary syndrome that maybe extended out a little bit further, the patient could have loss of taste and they could have an alteration in their heart rate, usually an increased heart rate and, and some blood pressure instability. And so... Um, here is for taste that uh, this feeds into the solitary nucleus and tract, and this will end up going all the way up to the thalamus in the solitary othalamic tract. Probably not real high yield point there, but more important would be the baroreceptor reflex. So we have these uh, stretch receptors in the carotid sinus and body and in the aorta, and so if the blood pressure um, and pulse is going up. Okay, that's going to activate these receptors. They feed into the solitary nucleus and tract, which is right here. Okay, so again, it's sensory. It's getting that information. And in that situation, the solitary nucleus and tract is right next to the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. And remember that this is the parasympathetic contribution to the vagus nerve. And so by activating the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, 
then we'll get increased parasympathetic tone, and the vagus nerve will go out to slow the heart rate down, um, to lower the blood pressure, and um, so you activate parasympathetics, and not shown here, but you also um, inhibit sympathetics in that situation. And so uh, this is uh, the baroreceptor reflex is helpful to understand something that is known as Cushing's reflex. And this occurs in patients that have increased intracranial pressure. And so recall down here at the bottom of the slide that patients that have increased intracranial pressure often will complain of headache, they'll have nausea and vomiting, they might be confused, and increased intracranial pressure tends to damage the sixth nerve, so they may have a bilateral sixth nerve palsy. So the patients are coming into the emergency room looking like this, okay? But the increased intracranial pressure activates the uh, uh, hypothalamus and the sympathetics, and that elevates the blood pressure, um, which actually is an attempt by the brain to get more pressure, because if there's increased intracranial pressure, then there's going to be less perfusion to the brain parenchyma. So by increasing blood pressure, we get more brain perfusion, which is a good thing, okay? But um, as the um, blood pressure goes up, well, now we're going to activate these baroreceptors, which are going to activate the parasympathetic system that I just showed you and the baroreceptor reflex. And so what the Cushing's reflex consists of is we have hypertension. It's usually a high systolic, low diastolic blood pressure. And the increased parasympathetic tone leads to bradycardia. And so a patient who maybe comes in with headache, confusion, and their blood pressure is really high and their pulse is really low, that's a neurologic emergency. Okay, that's the Cushing's reflex. And so you'd really want to get a scan uh, in that patient. And they may also frequently have irregular respirations known as chain stokes respirations. All right, so here's the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, um, which we've talked about earlier. Uh, remember supplying um, the lungs, the heart to slow the heart, the GI tract to stimulate uh, peristalsis, and so on. Okay, now the medial medullary syndrome involves the cortical spinal tract. Remember the medial cortical spinal tract here um, in the medulla. And so that will give the patient a contralateral hemiplegia. Okay, here are the posterior columns and the medial lemniscus. So again, it's medial. And so we're going to get a contralateral loss of vibration proprioception. And then our ipsilateral cranial nerve deficit is uh, involves the hypoglossal nucleus. So if the lesion is on the left, when the patient sticks their tongue out, the tongue will deviate to the left, and they'll have these right-sided motor and sensory deficits. So again, um, any brain stem syndrome, ipsilateral cranial nerve, contralateral motor or sensory. And so this is caused by, uh, there are these paramedian branches off of the anterior spinal artery, which supplies the medial medulla. So remember, with lateral medullary syndrome, of all the things that I told you those patients have, they're not weak. And they're not weak because the cortical spinal tract is in the medial medulla, not the lateral medulla. All right, so here's a nice cartoon drawing here of the medulla. And so you could spend some time here and just go over everything we just talked about with the cortical spinal tract here in the medullary pyramid, the medial lemniscus, the hypoglossal nucleus, that's our medial medullary syndrome. And then all of the things here in the lateral medulla, like the nucleus ambiguous, spinal trigeminal, nucleus and tract. But I wanted to point out one other area uh, back here, and that is the lateral vestibular nucleus, only because it has an important um, clinical correlation. So there are many upper motor neuron pathways that originate from the brainstem, and this is one. So from the lateral vestibular nucleus, we have the lateral vestibulospinal tract. And this is a very powerful extensor upper motor neuron pathway to extend the arms and legs. And I bring it up only because we will see in the when we get to coma that a lesion that occurs above the lateral vestibular nucleus really um, results in you're not able to inhibit the nucleus. And therefore, the lateral vestibular spinal tract is overactive. And this is what's known as decerebrate posturing. So it's a really bad sign when you see a patient in a coma and the arms and legs are extending, okay? And so I'll say more about how we localize that lesion in the coma lecture, but for now, the pathway involved 
is the lateral vestibulospinal tract. All right, um, a couple other things here in the medulla. Back here, here's the fourth ventricle. So kind of down here at the base of the fourth ventricle, we have an area that lacks a blood-brain barrier, and this is known as the area postrema, and so otherwise known as the vomiting center. And so if you're asked, like a patient is on a chemotherapeutic agent like cisplatinum, and they're throwing up, well, uh, this again lacks a blood-brain barrier, and so um, when we have nausea induced by medications, uh, this is the area of the brain that's involved in that. All right, so here's the medulla, and I just want to point out in this area here, which is the uh, cerebellopontine angle. So here's the pons, here's the cerebellum. Here we have cranial nerves 7 and 8 um, exiting in the cerebellopontine angle. And so a common tumor that will arise there is the acoustic or vestibular schwannoma. And so this tends to involve the auditory nerve, first of all, so patients lose hearing. But then, uh, as it extends, it involves the facial nerve, and so they'll have a lower motor neuron facial weakness. It may compress the cerebellum, and then they'll get some ipsilateral ataxia. It may involve the trigeminal nerve up here, and then they'll have some facial numbness. But again, it usually starts with hearing loss followed by uh, facial weakness. So if you see this on one side, it's a, an acoustic uh, schwannoma or vestibuloma. If we have bilateral cerebellopontine angle lesions, then the patient has neurofibromatosis type 2. Okay, so here is the distribution of the uh, trigeminal nerve. So you can just um, look at that for a minute. If you want to pause the video, I'll just point out that V1, notice, supplies... Uh, the eye and the cornea, V2, the cheek area, V3 around the uh, lower portion of the jaw. And so in terms of the trigeminal nuclei, first of all, we have the mesencephalic trigeminal nucleus, which is really a displaced sensory ganglia, okay? Um, and so uh, this receives information from jaw uh, chewing muscle spindles. So every time you chew or talk or move your jaw, we stretch these muscle spindles, which activates the mesencephalic trigeminal nucleus. And this then feeds back to the motor um, trigeminal nucleus. And so this is very important then for just accurate chewing and talking and any movement that has to do with your jaw. This is also the nucleus that's involved in the jaw jerk reflex. So if you tap the jaw, you activate muscle spindles and mesencephalic nucleus, which then feeds into the motor nucleus and your, the jaw snaps back up. Now the principal, or sometimes called the main or chief trigeminal nucleus, mediates facial tactile and pressure sensation. More importantly, it mediates the corneal reflex. So recall what happens here. You touch the cornea, okay? And remember the cornea is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. So this goes into the chief or principal trigeminal nucleus, which activates cranial nerve 7. And I can't show it here in this drawing, but it actually activates bilateral cranial nerve 7. And remember 7 closes the eye via the orbicularis eye, um, oculi. So again, if we touch one cornea, um, we actually stimulate bilateral facial nerve nuclei, and both eyes should close. Okay, And so if we had a lesion then of the trigeminal nerve, well, nothing is going to happen. We're not going to get any direct or consensual eye closure. Whereas if we have a lesion, let's say we're touching the right cornea, and we have a lesion here of the right facial nerve, well, then we're not going to get any direct eye closure, but the opposite eye will close. Okay, but practically, we really do the corneal reflex um, in our coma evaluation. So if we have a big pontine hemorrhage or something like that, um, you know, th then the corneal reflex will be absent in that situation. So if we have a patient in a coma and they have an intact corneal reflex, then it mainly tells you that the pontine circuitry is intact. The lesion is probably not in the pons. All right, now the spinal trigeminal 
nucleus and tract we've already talked about. This is the one that extends into the lateral medulla. This is the one that's involved in lateral medullary syndrome. So remember, it's ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature in that situation. All right, the facial nerve. This is a really nice drawing that a medical student uh, did for me uh, just recently. This would probably be more of an anatomy uh, question than a neurology question, some of the details on this slide. Um, so I still remember from medical school the branches here of the facial nerve to Zanzibar by motor car. So, um, and probably worthwhile knowing here that the cord of tympani, if we had the lesion there, then um, we would have um, loss of taste. But for neurology, probably most important is that you can distinguish uh, upper and lower motor neuron facial weakness. So if we have a Bell's palsy, okay, so here's a lower motor neuron lesion. Remember, what is a lower motor neuron? It's a nucleus, here's the facial nucleus, that directly supplies muscles. So if we have Bell's palsy, that's a lower motor neuron um, lesion, then the patient will have weakness of the forehead and lower face. And since the seventh nerve closes the eye, then acutely in a Bell's palsy, the eye is going to be open wider, and they're not going to be able to wrinkle their forehead on that side, and they're going to have a facial droop. Okay, if we have a stroke, and remember, what is the pathway that talks to cranial nerve nuclei that move muscles? It's the cortical bulbar tract. So if we have a lesion of the cortical bulbar tract, then notice that the um, part of the facial nucleus to the lower face is only supplied by the opposite side of the brain. Whereas the part of the facial nucleus for the upper face gets a bilateral supply from both right and left hemispheres. And so therefore, if we have a cortical bul bulbar tract stroke, um, the weakness is going to involve the lower face. So if you see someone in the emergency room that has lower facial weakness, we're more concerned about that patient having a stroke. If it's forehead and lower face and nothing else, then we're less concerned. It's Bell's palsy, we'll give the patient prednisone, perhaps acyclovir, um, good prognosis. All right, so the classic lesion in the pawns to be aware of involves cranial nerves six and seven. All right, so notice here's cranial nerve six and cranial nerve seven on its way out does a very interesting thing, it wraps around six. And so if you have a lesion in the pons, <coughs> excuse me, you get an ipsilateral six and seventh nerve palsy. And here's the cortical spinal tract, and we'll get a contralateral hemiplegia. Now you might get a contra contralateral sensory loss and all kinds of other things. But I think if we put these three together, that's probably good enough. So remember the basilar artery supplies the pons. So the, uh, the blood vessel involved would be branches off of the basilar artery. So here the lesion is on the left, so the patient will have right-sided weakness, okay, but they'll have an ipsilateral facial weakness, notice the droop of the face, and they'll have an ipsilateral weakness of the abducens nerve. So they lose abduction of the left eye, and the eye then gets pulled in by the normal medial rectus. So this is known as the Miller-Gubler syndrome. That's not important. What's important is that you can localize it to the pons and identify the blood vessel. Okay, so just um, uh, a section here of the brainstem showing you the um, facial nucleus wrapping around the abducens nucleus, which is right here. And here's a nice car cartoon drawing of that. Um, point out a couple of things. Uh, we have this cloudy uh, sort of mist of neurons throughout the brainstem. This is known as the reticular activating system. And uh, not seen very well here, but there's another pathway called the central tegmental tract. And I point these out just because of their clinical significance. So the reticular activating system activates the cortex. All right, and so if we have then a lesion in the pons, um, usually, like a pontine hemorrhage, it doesn't need to be very large, but if you knock out enough of the reticular activating system, your patient will be in a coma. Contrast that with the bleed of the same size in the brain, and the patient may have minimal symptoms. Reticular activating system, there are several upper motor, well, two upper motor neuron pathways that originate from the reticular activating system, so it's involved in muscle tone and posture, pain processing, and also just regulating a lot of function like blood pressure, breathing, GI, and cardiac uh, function. Um, 
So I mentioned the central tegmental tract. Um, here we can see it drawn in pink right here, and here's the pathway over here. Central tegmental tract connects the inferior olivary nucleus with the um, red nucleus. So inferior olivary nucleus is in the medulla, the red nucleus is in the midbrain. And um, so for lesions, for reasons that are not easy to um, understand, a lesion here results in a very curious thing where the patient's palate continually goes up and down, up and down. It never stops, continues through sleep, and this is called palatal myoclonus. So if we have a patient with that, we know the lesion is in the pons, and more specifically, the pathway is the central tegmental tract. All right, now we get up to the midbrain. And so let's just point out a little bit of the anatomy here. Here's the cerebral peduncle in the substantia nigra. And so we'll talk about Parkinson's disease later. But here in the cerebral peduncle, you know, we talk a lot about the cortical spinal tract, but the cortical bulbar tract travels right along with it. And we also have this connection between the cortex and the pons here that uh, we'll talk about, um, I'm sorry, the cortex and the cerebellum uh, that we'll talk about in the cerebellar lecture. So there are actually several pathways here that travel in the cerebral peduncle. All right, we have the red nucleus. And back here, we have the oculomotor nucleus to the third nerve, which is right here. And media, the most medial portion of that is the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, which is the parasympathetic contribution to the third nerve. Back here, we have the cerebral aqueduct and the periaqueductal gray, which is loaded with opioid receptors and is very important in um, regulation of pain. And back here, we have the superior colliculus and the pineal gland. So, um, third nerve palsy. You should know five causes of third nerve palsy that all have very unique presentations. First of all, notice here's the third nerve right here, and it is sitting right next to the uncus. So if we have a tumor or a hemorrhage, any kind of a mass, and the uncus herniates, it's going to push on the third nerve. And so a third nerve palsy in the context of coma um, tells us that it's an uncal herniation, an ominous finding. Right? Here's a third nerve over here, and notice that it's running parallel to a blood vessel right here, and this is the posterior communicating artery, which connects the internal carotid, with the posterior cerebral artery. And this is a very common site for aneurysms. They actually form a little closer up here to the internal carotid. And when these rupture, the hematoma pushes right on the third nerve. And so a sudden onset headache and third nerve palsy tells you it's a PCOM aneurysm. All right, if we have a cavernous sinus etiology, we're going to have other cranial nerves involved, and I'll show you a slide of that in just a minute. If we have a midbrain stroke, um, the patient will have a hemiplegia, that's known as Weber's syndrome, which I will show you in just a minute. And if we have ischemia of the third nerve, then that involves the eyelid, involves the eye, it's still going to be down and out, but it will spare the pupil. So the pupil sparing third nerve palsy, um, this would be the most benign etiology on the list here, because these patients actually have a pretty good recovery. All right, so in terms of Weber's syndrome, Here's the basilar artery, and um, here is the posterior cerebral artery. Notice you can't see the midbrain because it's deep in here. But the posterior cerebral artery here on both sides sends deep branches to supply most of the midbrain. So this was the best picture that I could find here to uh, sort of show you here off of the posterior cerebral artery. We get these deep penetrating branches. All right, so... Weber's syndrome, or the midbrain stroke, if you ask, were asked to identify the blood vessel, um, it is the posterior cerebral artery. Okay, and so what's involved in, in Weber's is the cerebral peduncle, and remember the cortical spinal tract travels through there, so the patient will have a contralateral hemiplegia, and the third nerve, and so patients will have an ipsilateral third nerve palsy. Okay, now there are a whole bunch of um, brainstem syndromes, we could go all the way back, um, but I think for step one, this is the one uh, that I would uh, highly recommend knowing about. All right, so again, it follows our rule of thumb for any brainstem syndrome. We get an ipsilateral cranial neuropathy, and then in this case, the third nerve. So a left third nerve palsy, it often looks just like this. The eye is completely closed, and you have to lift up the eyelid, and if you did, you'd see that the eye is in the down and out position, 
and we've got a big dilated pupil. Okay, and the pathway that's involved is the cortical spinal tract. So we get a contralateral hemiplegia, and again, you'd want to associate that with penetrating branches off of the posterior cerebral artery. And so here's a 12-year-old who has a partial third nerve palsy. And so notice we see ptosis here because the third nerve supplies the levator palpebra. So we're going to have ptosis. Um, we have involvement of the pupil, which is larger. And so this patient has a left third nerve palsy and also has right-sided weakness. So it is Weber's syndrome. And notice when looking up and down that the left eye doesn't cooperate. Okay, and uh, if the patient were to look to the right, the right eye would go out and the left eye would just stay here in the midline. But uh, I wish I had a picture here, but if the patient looks to the left, the um, sixth nerve is working, so the eye could abduct. Okay, and so when we shine the light in the eye, uh, the normal pupil will constrict. Nothing's going to happen over here because we've lost the efferent pathway. Now, I mentioned cavernous sinus as another important um, cause to know about in terms of a third nerve palsy. So if we look in the cavernous sinus, this will often be related to um, internal carotid artery. It could be a trauma. We could have a thrombosis here in the cavernous sinus. So here is cranial nerves 3, 4, 6, V1, and V2. And so all of these could be involved, especially V1 more than V2, in cavernous sinus thrombosis. So this, uh, you would think of cavernous sinus if it's really an ugly third nerve palsy. It's not just the third nerve. We got four, six, V1, and usually lesion here is gonna cause pressure behind the eye, and so we'll get proptosis. The eye is just getting pushed forward, and the eye is red, really ugly third nerve palsy. Okay, another drawing here of a right third nerve palsy, now with the eye clearly down and out. We can see the pupils dilated. So notice here with the right third nerve palsy, when the patient tries to look to the left, the eye can't cooperate at all. When the patient looks to the right, they're more um, conjugate. <clears throat> now, one thing I just wanted to point out, we do want to test whether the fourth nerve is functioning in patients that have a third nerve palsy. And so if you were to ask this patient to look to the left, we would be able to see that the third nerve, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth nerve is working in the right eye because we would see this in cyclotorsion. Okay, this eye would sort of twist down like this with attempted gaze to the left. And so that would tell us that the fourth nerve is intact. Now, while we're talking about the pupil, I mentioned... Um, Horner syndrome in lateral medullary syndrome. And so let's just review the anatomy of um, dilation of the pupil. So this is a three-order neuron chain that starts in the hypothalamus, goes down through the lateral medulla, all the way down to C8, T1, T2, where we have our first synapse. And then the second order loops over the apex of the lung, around the subclavian artery, to the superior cer um, cervical ganglion. And from there, Via, via a very complex route to dilate the pupil and also to supply Mueller's muscle, which is a minor um, eyelid elevator. And then along with the external carotid artery, it supplies blood vessels and sweat glands. And so um, um, Horner's syndrome can be caused by a pontine hemorrhage. Remember, we get pinpoint pupils in a pontine hemorrhage. It's really a bilateral Horner's. Lateral medullary syndrome, in terms of a second-order lesion, the most common board question would be an apical lung tumor. <clears throat> and if we have a carotid dissection, you will involve the pupil and uh, Mueller's muscle, but not the branches to blood vessels and sweat glands. So you won't have anhydrosis in that situation. So recall what is really helpful. If you see someone with asymmetrical pupils, and it's, um, it's often uh, more subtle than this, you have a little ptosis, maybe this pupil is a little bit smaller. We'll just dim the lights. And so notice this is the normal eye, so the sympathetics are going to be activated by dimming the lights. The pupil dilates. And now you can see that very obviously um, we have a problem here. If you weren't sure with the lights on, now we can see there's a very clear um, pupillary asymmetry. 
All right, now let's talk about the optic nerve and constriction of the pupil. So the anatomy here is the light as it enters the optic nerve. Some will cross at the chiasm. Some will stay at the same side here on the optic tract. Um, not shown here, we have a posterior commissure where light crosses back and forth a second time. So the important point is that light in one eye will equally stimulate both edinger westphal nuclei, and therefore the output via the third nerves through the ciliary ganglion will be exactly the same in both eyes. So that's why shining the light in one eye, you get perfectly equal constriction in both eyes. Now, let's say we have a patient with an optic nerve lesion, like optic neuritis, okay? Um, the important thing here is that the pupils will be symmetrical, always symmetrical. They're not asymmetrical, okay? And the reason is, if just 10% of light is getting through this eye, well, that 10% is going to equally stimulate both that inter-westphal nuclei. This optic nerve is normal, but it's still going to equally stimulate both that inter-westphal nuclei. Okay, so the pupils are always symmetrical with an optic nerve lesion. So if we shine the light um, here in the bad eye, in the left eye, depending on how much gets through, the pupils won't constrict very much. Here, um, you know, they're constricting somewhat. If we shine the light in the normal eye, then we see a more brisk constriction. But, it, you know, in the real world, it just is not that obvious. And so what you really need to do is to swing the flashlight back and forth. Okay, so here let's say we've sh we have the light in the normal eye, the pupils have constricted, and now we swing the flashlight back to the bad eye, and both pupils, notice both pupils dilate. Okay, and the reason that happens is you went from shining the light, blasting here, 100% light, stimulating the edinger westphal nuclei, and now you swing the flashlight back to the bad eye, and all of a sudden... There's much less stimulation of the edinger westphal nuclei, so both pupils dilate. So when you swing the flashlight to the bad eye, the pupils dilate. And this is known as the afferent pupillary defect, um, or the um, Marcus Gunn pupil. And so this tells us we have an optic nerve lesion. All right, here's just another really nice drawing that a student did recently. So if you want to... Um, you can pause the video if you want to spend a little more time looking at the nice uh, anatomy there. All right, so let's bring things, some things together here with regards to the pupil. Um, and so here we have, um, we can see the pupils are symmetrical um, in dark um, and in light. Okay. And also when the patient looks at something near, now it would have been nice, I suppose, if, if uh, we had a drawing here of the pupils without just in normal uh, light. But when you do look to the nose, there is some pupillary constriction. That's with uh, accommodation. All right, so this is normal. Okay, pupils dilate in dark. They constrict, of course, with light and with a near target. And so uh, this one here is what we see in a Horner syndrome. And so notice in the light, you know, it's quite subtle, okay? But again, you dim the lights, and now the normal eye here, the sympathetics, dilate the pupil. But here we have a sympathetic problem. The pupil doesn't dilate much. So this really brings out a Horner syndrome, dim the light. Whereas when we shine the light in either eye, uh, the pupillary asymmetry is, is not so obvious, okay? In this case now, we have asymmetrical pupils, mainly um, in the light, okay? And so um, in dark, they appear about pupil, uh, about equal, but in light, we have a quite obvious uh, asymmetry. And so uh, this is what we would see here. Notice this pupil is always the one that's dilated, and this is what you would see with a third nerve lesion. Now notice here, the pupil is not deviated out and laterally, and so this is what we might see with a ciliary ganglion um, lesion, um, or if the patient is um, using eye drops. So again, here's the ciliary ganglion. This is known as Aedes pupil. Uh, these are frequently young, healthy women that just wake up and look in the mirror, and their pupil is huge and dilated. Okay. So again, unlike a Horner syndrome, 
if we have a parasympathetic lesion, the pupil asymmetry is worse with light stimulation. Okay, an example D is what we see commonly in benign anisocoria. About one in five individuals have asymmetrical pupils. And so um, notice we've got just always the right pupil is just slightly more dilated than the left, but it's the same in light or um, dark. Okay, they always have the same, and here with accommodation, just a slight enlargement here of the right pupil. And so that's uh, just a benign normal anisocoria. All right, so remember the fourth nerve is the only one that exits the dorsum of the brainstem, and it supplies the superior oblique muscle. And the superior oblique, uh, recall that um, when the eye is looking to the nose, the superior oblique acts strongly to depress the eye to the nose. When the eye is looking in the abducted position, the superior oblique acts purely to what we call encyclotort the eye. So it twists it down and towards the nose. And so here we have a patient that has vertical diplopia, which is what a patient would complain of. In other words, the images are sort of one on top of the other after a motor vehicle accident. So trauma is a common cause of a fourth nerve palsy. And these can be very difficult to diagnose. If we just look at the patient here, you wouldn't um, necessarily see much of anything. But we'll notice here that in any direction of gaze, the left eye is always a little more elevated, a hyperopia. And so um, we can see that when she looks to the right or to the left, it's a little more elevated there. Oops, going the wrong direction. Okay, we see that obviously when looking up and when looking down. But what really helps to solidify this is to have the patient turn their head from one shoulder to the other. So when the patient turns her, her shoulder or her head to the right shoulder, and this would be good just to look in the mirror and you know prove it to yourself. What do your eyes do when you tilt your head back and forth? But when you tilt your uh, head to the right, what's happening is the opposite eye excyclotorts, the ipsilateral eye uh, encyclotorts like this. And so notice now the eyes look perfectly conjugate, okay, because this function, excyclotorsion, has nothing to do with the superior oblique muscle, okay, and that's why patients will tilt their head um, then to the opposite shoulder. And so, um, because it brings the images together, she's got a left fourth nerve palsy, and you can see why she would prefer to tilt her head to the right, because the images line up very well. But now when she tilts her head to the side of the lesion, to the left, okay, that's when this eye should normally encyclotort. And so she's lost that function of the superior oblique muscle, and now we've got a very obvious um, disconjugate gaze. Okay, a couple more things um, here. First of all, uh, the dorsum of the midbrain back here. If we have a lesion here, we get a dorsal midbrain syndrome, otherwise known as Perinod syndrome. And so I'll, the last slide I will show you here just illustrates a little bit of the anatomy of vertical eye movements, but it involves this portion, this dorsum of the midbrain. So if we have a lesion there, patients have difficulty looking up and down. And uh, we'll list a number of different things that can do that as we go through. But it also affects the pupils. So usually a dorsal uh, midbrain lesion, we get large, somewhat irregular pupils, and they do not react well to light. So um, again, here is another way of looking at um, light stimulation. Going back here to the pretectal nucleus, the androestral nuclei, and it only shows one half of it here, but going out via the third nerve to constrict the pupil. And of course, the same thing is happening in the other eye. And so if we have a lesion here, you interrupt this light stimulation of the Edinger-Westfall nuclei and the pupils are not going to constrict. But there's a separate pathway to activate the Edinger-Westfall nuclei when you look to your nose. And so pupillary constriction to accommodation is intact. Okay, And so this can be caused by lesions here, or um, neurosyphilis classically will involve this area as well. 
and this is known as the Argyle-Robertson pupil, where they don't react to light, but they do react to, um, they do constrict to accommodation. All right, in Paranod syndrome, we also frequently see eyelid uh, abnormalities, uh, really an eyelid retraction. So especially when the patient tries to look up, the eyelids just retract here. That's known as Collier's sign. And also when they try to look up, we get this convergence retraction nystagmus, where the eyes will quickly move to the nose and back out again uh, with attempted up gaze. Okay, and I hate to finish with such a busy slide here, but um, this is the anatomy of vertical eye movements here in the dorsum of the midbrain. Okay, and I really would not spend um, you know, time trying to figure this out. There are a number of different nuclei involved. I didn't want to just leave vertical eye movements as a magical thing, but there are a few things here I did want to just point out from this slide. First of all, the fourth nerve, remember that the nucleus, the, the nerve from the nucleus does cross over to the superior oblique. Um, just appreciate all of the nuclei that make up the third nerve um, here. And there's some interesting syndromes we could talk about, but I don't think you need to know that in detail. So with the third nerve palsy, of course, you're going to involve all these nuclei that are supplying, supplying all these individual eye muscles. Remember that myasthenia is a neuromuscular junction problem, and it can look a lot like a third nerve palsy, but remember the pupil will not be involved. Okay, and this will be an important slide when we talk about benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, where the otoconia goes into the posterior semicircular canal, which activates it. Okay, and we'll come back to this, but we'll say that activation goes up to the fourth nerve, to the third nerve nuclei, and results in this um, upbeat torsional nystagmus. So there actually are quite a few um, uh, teaching points from this very complicated slide. We'll stop there.